Why are you wearing that shirt right now? <laughs> That's the shirt I picked out. <laughs> Mate, what, how's the weekend, all right? Yeah, very good. Let's just point out the obvious real quick. I know the I know this story and I'm just so excited for you to tell it. No, no, no. Like we uh, are, I'm wearing this T-shirt. Oh, yeah, cool. And in about nine minutes time I'm going to be wearing a different t-shirt okay. just because we're mixing it up yeah, anyways, we, we, we spoke to Pete another time but that's alright yep. this is the intro for the pod yes hello tell me what happened on the weekend I'm excited to hear um, this so I'm a big F1 fan massive good um, and I went to the casino to watch the race yeah the final, final race. race of the season yeah. Max v Lewis for all the marbles Lewis v Max Max v Lewis yeah, this summer <laughs> and it was awesome Yeah, it was one of the it was one of the best races I've ever seen. There was about a thousand people at the casino watching it. The vibes. Saw some immaculate. footage. A lot of people there. Yeah. A lot. It was excellent. Um, got to chat to a back chat fan. You got recognised, mate. <laughs> if you're not going to tell this story right, <laughs> you got recognised. You got picked out of a, th- a crowd of thousands from nowhere. Hey, Dan. Yeah. Dan. You turn around. It's like, oh, one of my mates from school or something. Yeah. Dan from back chat. Yeah. Yep. Wow, this is a big, big moment, mate. So well, Dan from Backchat. Uh, do you know what? I you, think that's not on your LinkedIn bio <laughs> yet, is it? <laughs> it's not. Um, I think the. I think I. I, I feel bad because I didn't actually grab his name. He probably told it to me, but it was very loud in there. You're a big head, eh? You're such, <laughs> like, you're such a celebrity now, bro. So I think he sort of he wanted to come over and have a chat, and I'm you know I love I love to have a chat, of course, all the time, anytime. Um, but I think he sort of bit off more than he could chew and realize. Um, after five minutes of me yelling at him because it was so loud and I'd had a few beers, um, he was like, maybe he just wanted to come f- for a quick hello, but the next thing you know, I'm screaming at him about the F1. So, and you got a photo? Yeah, we did the photo thing. Oh, um, and they did say they're going to post it for socials or something. So, look, if you, they would be listening to this, so please send it. Send it in. You send it. We put it up. Back chat 2.0. Here we go. The podcast uh, with the now world famous Dan Const <laughs> and Will Schofield. Uh, you know where you can find us. Yep. Backchatpodcast.com.au. It's got it all. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're watching on YouTube right now. Hello. How are Hello. you? Uh, it's all building nicely. Been speaking to some really, really great, great athletes so far. Big one today. I'm excited. <laughs> you're so excited. Um, I'm properly excited. Uh. You are. You fanboyed hard. Yeah. Well, that's okay. That yeah. happens from time to time. Yeah. Well, you were like that with Bogut. Nah, I think I was pretty... C- mate, I've had Dirk Nowitzki's shower water drop on me while he was... So, and I was Put it here, mate. Shake my hand. Yeah, yeah. I love a couple of name Dirk drops. Dirk Nowitzki. Hey, um, I wouldn't be surprised if Dirk was dropping, hey, I, I met Dan Const that time probably. because now how famous you are right yeah. now. See, that makes me happy you got recognised in public. Very good. Um, you, you tweeted this week about the F1. You said it wasn't really a fan before this season. Yeah, no. Nah, well, I, I don't reckon I've ever watched a race. Um, yep. uh, what, previous to this race? or barely, this Not season? a race start to finish. I just, I just had no understanding of mm. what was going on. Like, the, you know, the little nuances, the little things, the competition for... F- you know, the top spots in opposed to the middle rungs and towards the back end. Like, yep. there's a lot going on there. And then the different things with the cars, different rules. I didn't understand it before this year. Mm. Um, it's bloody good, isn't it? It was exciting. It was. But people are also saying this is the best season in the last century. Um, like, it's never been a better season. So it's probably the best season to start watching is an exciting one. Yep. What did you think about, just quickly, like, the you're result? a big fan. Well, no, well, yeah, the result and, and, and what happened. Because it was... Mm. It was uh, official uh, meddling a little bit, right? Yeah, so um, Michael Massey. The Aussie. The Aussie, who's always a welcomed well, a welcomed sight when I hear him on the team radios when he talks to the team principals. It's great because the Australian accent, he's very Australian. Is him and Dan Ricardo the only Aussies involved in anything to do with their <laughs> flying? <and laughs> no, there's probably some <laughs> other people involved. But um, he's you know in, involved in this because he made a pretty big call. But the problem, well, not the problem, but the thing for me is I'm a massive Max Verstappen fan. Are you? Yeah. I've been rooting for Max for the last few seasons and really wanted him to beat Lewis. So when the result went their way, I was stoked. Mm. Had it gone, had the roles... Complete opposite thing happened. I would be... I would be writing emails to the FIA. I'd probably fly to the headquarters. I'd be appearing in court witness, like, because of uh, Max being robbed of something. But... Yeah. Oh, look, I'll put it in context with footy. I watched it. 
I watched the whole season. There's a lot of up and ups and downs in F1, and there's a lot of luck, and there's a lot of influence from upstairs in the booth. Something goes wrong on out on the track. They 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 have a bit of a flashing light come up, and, and it'll be like decision decision pending, kind of like the cricket. Yep. Um, you know, no ball or, or or a good ball, and then they'll put a pending you know decision out off five minute penalty, a five five second stop go or fifteen second stop go. It seems kind of you know a bit grey, not Making, really. Yeah, they're making a lot of black and white. It's tough. It's tough. They're making decisions sort of on the fly. And um, is it any different to an umpire in the AFL making an incorrect decision in the last quarter of a grand final? I I think it is because the rules are a bit more black and white in the F1, and the controversy was around. They certainly are not. The controversy was around them making one rule, then sort of changing it, then changing their mind. But you know what? Michael Massey just said, "What we want is them to race. We made them race." And Max won the race. Like it was fascinating because the principals, effectively the coaches of the teams, were mm. speaking to the head referee yep. during race, which happens every race. Oh, yeah. it's, it's not like this was the first time they were allowed to communicate. Every race they're either petitioning for something or they're asking for something to be looked at. Yep. This is how F1 goes. That's mm. how I looked at it. No, Didn't Mikey. This is wrong, Mikey. That's my Toto Wolf. Yeah, I like um, it. Yeah, I like listening to Toto on the radio. He complains a lot. Go, um, Max. Well done, Max. F1, that was insane. Not much footy news going on at the moment. Which is fine. Yeah, because... Just tune into Back Chat. Yep. Subscribe to YouTube channel. That's right. Um, like it. And also, a new one I heard recently was um, click the bell or something on YouTube because it gives notifications on me. We got Sammy, the graphic designer in the house. What does the bell mean? What is that? Yeah, it turns on notification. Yeah, click the bell. <laughs> Listen to Sammy, click the bell. All right. There you um, go. Good. I'm glad we got Sam here because yeah. I would not have known. Saving that. us constantly. GWS made a big call this week. Ah. Greater Western Sydney Giants. They have announced a lineup of three <laughs> captains. <laughs> That's hilarious the way you describe it. Yeah, lineup. Yeah, yes. they've got a three man lineup as a captain. Trio. Cap trio. I don't even know how I feel about the co-captain situation, let alone three. I'm going to have to pass this on to you. Your thoughts on having more than one person, which will probably delve into then the role of the captain and how that changes when you have three of them. Look, overall, my first impression, I laughed. I thought that is an absolute... It's not a disgrace or anything like that, but it seems strange. So, Cornelio, Green, Kelly. Yeah. Three man lineup. They're three best players. So, I don't know how deep you want me to go with this, Dan, but like leadership groups for mine throughout my playing career mostly consisted of the best players. Does that, does that sound weird? In my mind, it does, but maybe it doesn't. I mean, I find usually the best, the absolute best player isn't the captain. That doesn't that doesn't come hand in hand. But usually, you know, they're in a, a leadership group. There's there's two ways I've heard of thinking about leadership and talking about leadership and how you you know uh, assign that within groups. There's the you know the consistency that's required to be a great player, and that makes you a leader. And the ability to consistently perform to prepare. Um, a little bit of do as I do kind of thing. Yep. Um, so to be a great player, there's not many great players that just have talent and, you know, they're only good because of their talent. Uh, the other sort of form is great leaders because of how they teach or how they lead, not by how they play or how they train or how they prepare. Yes, they would – great leaders do all those things well, but how they actually – speak to players, how they communicate, how they can get people to buy into not only game plan but team culture. Um, the best leaders I've ever played with were the – not do as I say, but they would be followed by you know, players that were leaders in that sense, if you know what I mean. Like they, they led in my mind and they were never the best players. The best leaders I play with were never the very best players. Yep. And so – I look at Cornelio, Green and Kelly, the three best players on GWS list, and it's not weak, but it's like, I don't know if we can make a decision here, guys, that's going to piss someone off, that someone's going to be upset. So let's just give it to them all. You could do the same thing, name one captain, have two vice captains, and onto your second part of your question about 
what are actual captains do, there's not actually a lot that a captain does that's any different to a vice captain. Yep. Like externally there is. They they they're sort of like the the head of the footy club. They do a lot of the press conferences. They speak after games a lot. They are often if something controversial happens, they go to the captain. They roll the captain out, right? Yep. And so now I mean GWS have got they've got damage control. They've got three options. Yep. But in terms of actual leadership within the group, being the captain, in my experience anyway, it doesn't really mean much more than a vice captain. Like in the back part of my career, Shannon Hearn was my captain, Luke Shuey was my captain, Josh Kennedy, Jeremy McGovern were vice captains, Luke Shuey was a vice captain. They're all about the same leaders to me. Shannon Hearn, um, out of all the guys in probably my last 10 years, was a real leader because of his ability to lead, not because of his ability to play. And I think too often, this would summarise how I feel, too often guys are put in leadership positions, i.e. captain, because of how they play and not because of how they lead. Right. So I feel like this is how you play and not how you lead, even though I would have no fucking idea, Dan. Yeah. I don't know what, how, that, how good the leaders are. This is what's, yeah. I guess, wonderful about sitting back here and just talking absolute jargon. Uh, speaking of jargon, <laughs> you send it, we read it. Yes. Now, before we get to Peter Bowl. Mm. Which we're both very excited about. I'm more excited. Yes. Um, self as a self-proclaimed 800 meter champion. Yeah, I mean, we asked our guests what uh, achievements you've had off the chosen field or track or. Yep. You're ring. constantly talking about an 800 meter race. Yeah, oh, yeah, it was a big, pretty big deal back big in the day. Race. I mean, it's a big, you know, it's a big deal. Big mm. quick runner. Well, let's see what Peter Bell thinks about it. Look, if he's <laughs> impressed, if he's impressed <laughs> with what I've got to say. That the proof will be in the pudding, mate. Okay. If Peter Boll is excited by what I have to say about the sort of times I was running, then you can shut the hell up. Okay, of course he'll be nice to you, though. Um, you send it, we read it. Let's get into that quickly. Do it before we chat to Peter. You promised me stings last week, and we don't have them. You send it, we read it. Da-da-dun, da-da-dun. Good. I think that's ESPN. Yeah, that's good. Jordan Flynn. Yeah, let's um, yeah, let's copyright. Yeah, great, that's good. <laughs> Ahoy, gents. Mm. Hope things have been going swimmingly. First and foremost... For moist. <laughs> Come on, Daniel. Yes. Come on, Daniel. First Get and head foremost, out of the gutter. just want to give my business hearing again a plug. Now, this isn't what it says in the email, but we have always said, if you send send it, we will read it. Yeah, and we'll plug it. So that's fine. You send it, we you plug it. Exactly. Another great segment. <laughs> um, so for just $499, you can purchase your very own high quality, high, for, high performance. Uh, do you want to just take a break? You want me to read it? No. That's three, that's three words. Okay. For just $499, you can purchase your very own quality, high-performance, ready-to-use digital hearing aid from your local pharmacy 777. <laughs> Avoid spending thousands on hearing aids. Oh, Do you need a speaking aid? What's happening? You okay? You may, be entitled, <laughs> you may be entitled to a rebate of up to 100% from your health insurer. Please check with your health insurance provider. Secondly... Can so I reread really that? Good. I want to plug it. First and foremost, just wanted to give my business hearing again a plug. <laughs> For just $499, purchase your very own quality, high-performance, ready-to-use digital hearing aid from your local Pharmacy 777. Avoid spending thousands on hearing aids. Mm. You may even be entitled to a rebate of up to 100% from your health insurer. Please check your health insurance provider. Yep. Secondly, what is the best <laughs> roast you've ever heard during an AFL game? So you've you've talked about some you've you know you've brought up a couple in the past where crowds have roasted you. What about because because you've talked about that? What about roasts that you maybe have heard from other players, <sighs> or maybe a teammate that's roasted another player, um, or or another coach? Yeah, Can whomever. I um, yeah. I, I, I we lost a game in Sydney. Um, pretty sure it was Woosha, and he went to absolute town on. It could have been Simo. That's how good of a roast it was. I can't remember who gave it. I just remember the reaction because I was up the back, and it was given to senior players, mm. saying that they checked out. Right. Um, went playing for the jumper, playing for themselves, worried yeah. about getting touches. Yep. It was a good one though, like so real, real hard hitting, real hard hitting. Bit of trembling in the voice. I think a good roast always has a bit of a tremble. Simo used to love a bit of a tremble. Right, bit and of conviction. Yeah, I mean, it shows some emotions. He used to get right into it. The bottom lip used to go when Simo was having a real go. And look, I'm not, I'm not bagging that because I was on the receive, yeah, I was on the receiving end of a few of those. Sometimes to my face, sometimes over the phone. 
Yep. Um, could always hear the lip trembling. That's not leadership. <laughs> Do we speak about that? Oh, I love uh, bringing it up. Okay, that's not leadership. Yeah, that was when I uh, had butted uh, Zach Butters. Yep. And Regrettable. You picked up the phone on the bench and, and, he, and the camera went perfectly to Simo where he mouthed perfectly exactly you could read what he said. Back to you. Hang up the phone. Yeah. Friend. I mean, I, what, what do you respond there? What do you, what do you, do you, you argue? Just take it. No, you just take it. You, you, you hear it. You cough it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, great. One little one or we got one little one, one more? Oh, yeah. So last week, got an email from Pamela Yovanovich. So she emailed us to thank us about the charity that we plugged. Now, she did ask us not to read out the email. And don't worry, I'm not. No, we won't. We won't because you asked us not to. But I do want to connect correct the pronunciation of her name. Right, which you just pronounced wrong again. Yes, because I want to like <laughs> link okay. it to that. Good. I said Pamela Ivanovich. Her name is Jovanovic, not Ivanovic. And I'm sorry, Pam, for yeah. doing that. We're sorry. But we did get your email. Thank you for sending it to us. That's it. You send it, we read it, and now we get to speak to Peter Bowl. If you love what we're doing, if you love this episode and you are just listening, jump onto YouTube. 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 And subscribe to the channel. Mm. It helps us out. And you can see us. You can see us doing it yeah, in the flesh. You know Let's go change t-shirts because I think that's a good idea. I might get my hair cut too. Done. <laughs> okay, this is a big moment for the podcast. Well, honestly, Dan, it's a big moment for me, mate. Um, I've told you off air. I've told you. I've told our <laughs> listeners beforehand. If I had to pick any Australian athlete, and I'm talking any, mm. and I'm not making this up because he's sitting right here with us. But if I had to pick one Australian <laughs> athlete to interview, it'll be Peter Boll. Yeah, you're and fanboying hard. And he's fucking here. Yeah. We've got him. How are you, Pete? Good to have you on the show, mate. Mate, I, lo- I love the hype. I love the energy. And <sighs> I'm happy to be in the show. Like, I feel like you don't really need much of an introduction. But our listeners probably do need, you know, I, I, you don't. But uh, Peter Boll, 800-meter runner. Um, he's had quite a journey to get here. Um, Sudan via Egypt to Australia started running pretty late uh, figured out he could run pretty fast and uh, found himself in a couple of Olympic games and the story doesn't finish but most recently you would have seen Pete run in the Olympic final um, over in Tokyo with a fourth place finish but Pete I'm going to wind it all the way back to the start but all of our guests we've had on so far um, and we've had some big names not as big as you but the first question we always ask them and this will get you off guard a little bit. I want to hear your best sporting achievement, not on the athletics track. So you can't use yeah, no running. You can't use your sport of choice. I don't want to hear you came fourth in the Olympic Games, mate. Yeah, like who, no, who cares? <laughs> doesn't count for nothing here. <laughs> what? what um, give, give me your best sporting achievement, not on the track. I've got. I've got a few. Um, mm. So, I guess. I'd say I, I went to school on a basketball scholarship, so that's that's oh, a good okay. one. Right, okay. Here we go. Um, I was I was dunking when I was in year ten, and I'm not even six foot, so that's another one. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And I, I guess this is on the track, but high jump, I didn't know how to do the frosby flop, and I would scissor kick one eighty. <laughs> how, no, how tall? How tall are you, Dan? I'm one sixty five. Yeah, he's, he's frosby flopping your ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need to teach me how to dunk, man. I, I need, I need, I need to learn how to to get some more hops. Um, I, don't, I don't think I'm the best person right now. I think I've been running too much. Um, I don't know if I can get up there anymore. But Pete, have but you? We can have a go. We have can you, have a try. Have you played cricket, Pete? Have you played much cricket while you've been over here? Honestly, that's the only sport I probably have never played. Well, like you're in good company there, mate. You want to tell him? Or you want me to? Oh, look. <laughs> I've been copping a bit of flack lately for bringing up my. <laughs> as you can see, there's a there's a cricket trophy here. Um, that's yeah. my under twelves from Chuit Hill Cricket Club, one of the best clubs in, going around in Perth. Uh, five wickets for sixteen runs, and that's the ball from the. That's the ball. Um, it was in a final, so that's my sporting achievement. Um, I could talk footy, basketball. I've won. I've won a championship playing basketball in um, you know men's D grade at uh, at Warwick Leisure Centre. Um, it's good, man. So I've, you know, lots of lots of sports. Well, you've you've got a bit of a claim to fame with with sports, not in footy, of course. Well, well, mine like I've got a few like Pete. You know, we just us athletes. We have a few multifaceted. Um, look, I've got a couple under eight. So I was a state champion in the eighty meter hurdles. Um, I haven't rolled that one out before. I was state no, champion. You brought that up. <laughs> no, I have. Okay. Um, 
Look, I used to be an 800 meter runner. I don't know if I've told you that before, which is why I'm very what, happy. What time did you run? Look, I got, look. Oh, oh, here we go. Is, all right, everyone, just me and Peter's going to talk times, guys. Um, uh, one fifty three, but I was seventeen, so I was I, I got down. Oh, you right, one fifty three. Yeah, that's good, Sheesh. right? Hey, is it all right? He's, yeah, that's, he's being nice. That's too. good. Like, yeah, no, nice. like honestly, I, I, I started running when I was seventeen, and I was running about two or five, two or six. So he was faster than me when he was. <laughs> okay, so what you've just told me and our so, listeners, Pete, I, I could be the greatest in the world right now. Is that what you're saying? Oh, I'm, I'm saying put ten years, put ten years, uh, okay. and you might you might be the Australian record holder. Okay, good. Okay, good. All right. So, yeah, so we are talking to the Australian record holder of the Olympic uh, of the 800 meters, who have just said, "Oh, that's pretty good." About yeah. my time down. Of course, so, he's going to say it's not. He's he's a nice guy. Look at him. Uh, I've got so many. <laughs> so I'm very excited. Uh, I've got so many questions for you, mate. Um, I want to start with though. Before we get into your story, are you a footy fan? I, I hear you're a footy fan. Yeah. Who's your team? Yeah, I love the West Coast. You know, that's good. That's my team, um, West Coast. Good. Uh, but you know, moving to Melbourne, I just got into footy in general, and then I was actually hanging out with um. A leader on the weekend, so oh, a yeah? friend of mine. Oh, true. So, uh, but yeah, definitely West Coast fan. Am I am I allowed to ask? Look, you can just tell me. No, I'm not allowed to ask, and I don't care. But I'm, am I allowed to ask about your uh, your cousin? Is it your cousin? Am I allowed to ask about that? You know what? I was thinking if I was there live, I would bring him with me today. So yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Talk me through it. I mean, we we run we speak a fair bit about the AFL. It was reported that your cousin was the streaker in the grand final. Is that correct? Yeah, but you know what? Let's just get... I wasn't even in the country, so um, <laughs> I have no idea why my name was thrown out there. Yeah, correct. I wasn't even in the country. <laughs> correct. I, I, was actually in London, I was actually in London at the time. He was using you as inspiration, though, surely. But I don't, I don't think he was... Oh, I guess so. And the funny thing is, is um, they were saying that he had more crowd in Tokyo, which is actually kind of true. <laughs> <laughs> Just run in front of more people. He needed to run faster than you. All right, all right mate. So uh, that's out of the way. Talk, talk to me about um, – I want to get into your journey a little bit. Um, you know, it's – I guess it's not – it's certainly not like my story, you know, growing up in Australia and private school and pretty much everything given to me that I ever asked. Um, you started in Sudan. You you're born in Sudan and um, you sort of made your way here, mate. Tell me about – how that all came about and, and what that was like in coming to Australia. Um, I, I did go to a private school too, though. So, <laughs> good, 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 good. <laughs> so maybe I had, I had the best of both worlds. Um, mm. Yes, yeah, so I, I was born born in Sudan. Uh, I think this story has been heard so many times. and But it's still reported wrong so many times. Like you see the dates, they just don't add up sometimes. So what's wrong? I was there Tell me for what's six wrong. years. I was there for six years and then moved to Egypt for another four. Um, so I was in Australia by the age of 10 and I was in Toowoomba, a little town in, in Queensland. Uh, that's why I got into sports, a bit of rugby league, not footy really. They were all into rugby. Um, and then I moved to Perth in 2008. So when I was in high school, so I started there. Then I moved to Melbourne probably at the age 20, when I was in 2015. And then now like I'm, I'm everywhere. So. Yeah, it's a crazy journey because I don't have a place that I kind of call home. So I just call myself a global citizen because, you know, I'm two months in Perth, five months in Melbourne, and how many of a month overseas? You got a you got a big family? You close to your family? I'm sure you saw <laughs> on the on the TV. Yeah, yeah. Got a massive family. I've got four brothers, um, and one sister. That's just immediate family, and then I've got a lot of you know extended family. But once in our culture, everyone's family, everyone's uncle, and auntie, everyone's cousins, you know. So yeah, that's how it works. So um, when when you when you reflect on kind of you know, I kind of agree with you. I'm sure everyone asks you the same stuff about where you're from. How, how you know how was that journey along the way? But when when you reflect about some of the lessons you learned, um, you know, some of the uh, experiences you went through, how does that reflect uh, on you as an athlete? Like back the other way, like how is kind of how you were brought up turned into what you are on the Aths track? I guess, I guess mentally, because we're just, you know, I'm just resilient because you've been through so much. So like 
losing a race on the track is not a big deal or or like you just tend to brush things off pretty fast because you know you, you come up from a tough upbringing and you come up um from a world where you just kind of all you rely on is people and stuff like that so i guess that kind of worked pretty well so like i remember just kind of starting athletics when i was 17 and and i'd see i'd see some of the kids training there and that they want to be there and their parents were forcing them there and i'm like like why are you there then like just <laughs> just don't rock up or like um i think there was one point i see i see one of the parents like bring them parades and water and whatever and i'm like damn must be nice you know <laughs> like <laughs> like am i here, uh, I'm, out, I'm out here catching buses to the track and whatnot so it's kind of just different lifestyle you know um so like what's what's taken for granted here i tend to see it more of an opportunity because we didn't have it so, so then that makes any sense so then what what really drove you then as a 17 year old when you see people you know obviously just getting lifts and power aids and waters and stuff like that and then the other end you're seeing, <laughs> you're seeing kids that don't want to be there they'll give me water yeah yeah but <laughs> <laughs> no one's free no one's free <laughs> that was free but then but then like you know so when you're 17 like there's not I, you're not really i don't i remember being a 17 year old not really motivated to do much but like what what really drove you then to stay around and commit to athletics at that age uh I guess opportunities because, and winning, I was like addicted. Like I grew up with four brothers, so everything was pretty competitive. And once I started winning, it gets addictive. Like you want to win. So I won school. I wanted to be the fastest in the school. I wanted to be the fastest boy at all the schools. And then I wanted to be the fastest in the state, the fastest in the country. And you just keep entertaining those different thoughts. And then you're like, man, I, I might actually be able to do it. But you never really know until you kind of keep going. So that was that. And then number two was literally, I never really got into running until like the olympics which is five years after i started like i was like damn maybe i might be pretty good because before that i was just like man i could use running to kind of travel like we didn't have no family holidays and stuff like that so like i, I went to sydney for states i was like man this is dope like if i can come if i can go back train again and then 2015 i went to i went to paris um to compete in a few races in europe and i was like man that's kind of nice like i'd never get to travel again and like Although running still wasn't the sport that I wanted to be in, but it got me to go different places. So I was like, man, I'm going to just use it. And then eventually I actually fell in love with it. So it worked out pretty well. We, um, I mean, we, we, there's a lot of Olympic coverage back here in uh, Australia while you're in the, you know, in uh, Japan. And we, we saw a fair bit of your teacher and, uh, you know, the stories around her effectively teaching you everything you know about running. Um, <laughs> but I know you, I've heard you speak about that before. I, I did want to ask, the individual like element of running, do you, do you, do you get that team element? Like when you sort of decide to go down the running path, um, h how does that work with you? Do you, do you feel like it's an individual sport or is there team elements to it? I guess that's why it was pretty boring at the start. Cause it just felt like you're running laps around circles by yourself. Cause it didn't feel like a team sport. And then like five years later, you're at the Olympic games and then you got a team, you got a training club you got a coach you got a manager and it's like oh this is more of a team and then 10 years later you athletics is so unique because it's like such a um a multicultural sport like for any country like that's why it's so competitive because anyone can run you just need a pair of shoes actually you don't even need shoes to run <laughs> so that's why it gets super competitive at, at the olympics and that's why we say when you compare athletics to other sports it's pretty hard like um when for example when you have assuming you take the whole um, continent of Africa out of it like there's there's not many people there um, swimming for medals yeah. but when you go to running you've got South America you've got Africa you've got every single continent so it's unique and in that way you like get to meet everyone from across the world and it's it's like man it's like and then it becomes a team because even the people you're competing against um like I was after the Olympics I went back to Europe and after I finished competing you know you just like which friends do I have you know I had a friend from the UK I called him I said let's was go to Portugal on the holiday. And then we just went to Portugal on the holiday, had a different friend. We went and meet, meet them. So then it becomes more of a team sport. Yeah, that's cool. You were just saying how sort of anyone can run. All you need is a pair of shoes. And, and actually you don't. I mean, there's people that are like the barefoot runners and stuff. Do you have 
experiences then when people want to challenge you to runs because like I can run and you can run and like there's probably I'm sure there's guys and girls out there that like see you and like I can I, I could beat him like do you get challenged to races just <laughs> by regular people <laughs> uh, no, uh, sometimes but like but like not in um not not just randomly in the middle of the street or something like that but <laughs> yeah so, sometimes <laughs> sometimes people do challenge you and um and I, you just, it's hard to explain, like, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not just going to race you for no reason. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, what's, what's the purpose to this? Like, we just, we just, we just going to run. Like, it sounds pretty silly. To win. Like, um, you just said you love winning, <laughs> Pete. To win, mate. Just beat yeah. everyone. There's someone yeah, but, there. but like, but I like, what's on the, what's on the line? What's on the line? <laughs> just if, bragging If rights. someone wants to challenge me to race, there's, there's good, bragging right for who? So, yeah, it's, for it's, you. it's already yeah. bragging rights for them. Yeah, it's already right. bragging rights for them so what's in it for me yeah, you've got everything to lose and some random dude at the pub exactly like, dude, I, I beat peter ball in a race you wouldn't believe it but i did like, although 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 actually speaking about that in portugal some i did race someone on a night out and um <laughs> yes and i think i think it was like 2 a.m and we're out and some random just wanted to challenge me and Man, I blitzed them. Like, was- <laughs> Tell me about that. I'm going to ask you about. I'm going to ask you about another race. I'm more interested in this race. Two <laughs> AM Portugal. Tell me about it. Nah, and to be honest, I don't even think it was a guy. It was a girl, and I just smashed her. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, but um, other than that, you just you just kind of have fun with it. But like, if someone's challenging you, you're not, you're not trying to slow down and stuff like that. Kids always try to challenge you as well, so you kind of got to look at their energies. You don't want to destroy their confidence, but you also don't want to treat them like um like kids and spoil them. Like you don't want to lose. Um, if they seem competitive, then you gotta you gotta give it to them. Like you don't want to lose. Like I remember, <laughs> and my friend always held me. Um, my friend always got on me for this. But um, one time I was I was at the basketball court and and some kid said I'm gonna beat you, and I said no, you're not. And he said he said well if I beat you, you give me fifty dollars. I said well then what's it up for me? And he had a Kobe Bryant jersey. Lake is my favorite. I said, well, if I win, I take your jersey. <laughs> and if you win, I give you two hundred dollars. And up to up to eleven, and you start on nine. And I beat him, and I took his jersey home. And this kid was like, I think. He... <laughs> and and I still have that jersey, Melvin. And um, and this kid just woke up with my jersey. Yeah, like I was like, I kind of I kind of felt bad, but I said, man, this kid this kid's gonna learn somehow. That's a fair bet. That's a life lesson learned <laughs> for the good. young fella. Learn, young fella. Um, I wanted to and only because he was so arrogant too. <laughs> Very good. Pete Bowl out there just teaching blokes lessons. Like, don't yeah, you challenge it. me. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to get my fanboy on a bit, Pete, and talk about the eight hundred meter race, like the actual race, right? Um, for Dan and for and for <laughs> listeners, the two minute mark, right? When you're a youngster, the two minute mark is kind of like it's not like a hat trick in cricket, but it's kind of like that mark where. Pete probably never had this actually because he was probably just like sub two like the whole time. But two minute is like you just want to get under two, you want to get under two, you want to get under two. And then when you yep. do it, you just feel – you just start stripping off the time, right? But you can never get under two. It's really hard to. Do you remember getting under two minutes, Pete? Am I talking shit or is this a thing? This is a thing, right? Or am I just making this up? <laughs> I, I did. I did get under two after three months of training. Yeah. And um, <laughs> That's good. <laughs> it only took me like I don't know, twelve years or something. Else. <laughs> but but you know what? Um, because being so naive on times and running, like to be honest, I started running ten years ago, and like I, I kid you not, there's a race on YouTube. I think it was maybe 2011. I started running, and um, I think I ran the first 500 to 600 meters of the race in lane two because I thought you had to stay in lane two where you started. Like <laughs> like that was ten years ago. So I was not concerned about no time. I was concerned about nothing i was just concerned about winning because i figured if you're winning surely you go somewhere i didn't really know much about timing but like how crazy is that like that's 10 years ago and then 10 years later um we're racing uh for like for like gold against the best in the world in like 10 years before that i'd even run the 800 properly yeah well that's, but are you racing against guys they've been they've been racing since they were 10 years old right like most of the guys you're racing with professionally they're 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 lifelong athletes i'm assuming some 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 are, and maybe I'm. I'm not sure about everyone's story, but yeah, generally everyone starts pretty early. Um, but at the same time, uh, I don't take credit from that because I think I started sports pretty early. It's not like I started sports in 2011. Yeah, I was playing basketball. I was pretty active before that, so like I had that natural endurance. It's just like 
some cultures just do other things better than others. Like I'm, I was saying, if I started swimming 10 years ago, I wouldn't be at the Olympic final. There's no chance. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's a bit different. <laughs> you might, mate. You never know. What was, what was Eric the nah, Eagle? I, I Eric was some beanie, mate. Eric, Eric the Eagle. I, I definitely know. I could put a bet on that. <laughs> <laughs> what? All right, all right. How about this one? Can you explain to listeners um, and, and tell the guys watching on YouTube, what, what does running an 800 meter race feel like? Like explain what that's like <laughs> and why it's different to any other race. Well, as one, it depends on your fitness and it depends. It depends so no, much. You, so- you, you, Oh, for me, not Dan, for me, not Dan running 800. I, I could run 800, whatever, two minutes. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> man, it's just, it, it's real nice, man. Especially when you're fit, you just, you just kind of bre- like those, those Olympic semifinal and heats. They were just like, I didn't know I was running that fast. That's why I was slowing down. If I knew I was running that fast, I would have tried to run 143. Like, um, <laughs> cause there's, think about it. There's no one in, in the Australian history period that's run under 144. And I'm out there slowing down, um, running 144s. So like, once you get into that position, once your body is like, all like, um, what is it? Just muscle memory and you're just in motion. You don't even know how fast you're running. It's just becomes. It just becomes art and you're just like wow and you're just kind of flowing 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 and it's so nice it's just it's like 800s oh, no. are like a, a pretty fluctuant in in the times you run like you can pop out a 147 depending on what the race you're in like it is it is dependent on the the race right and who's around you you can't just go and do your own thing in these races david, nah, david it, yeah you, you got yeah take it from there like it's it's not just yeah. a pure pure race right i think before i cut you off you're gonna say david Renisha. yeah and david, yeah yeah he was the only man in the 800 and i see you did your your research but you did run 153 so you know you know you know running mate, uh, David David Radisha, was the only man that- he's the goat mate. <laughs> 141 the only man in history like the greatest 800 meter race of all time 2012 london olympics i don't need to do my research this is muscle memory for me mate i'm an 800 runner this is it david radisha he's the king the goat hook him up <laughs> the goat he, he's the only he's the only man that could dictate a race from like win a race from start to finish like yeah. when david radisha was running everyone else was running for second and it was just like no one was gonna bet on that like david radisha was gonna win but now it's quite tactical and in a way no one wants to lead the race and it really depends like how was the final the slowest race of the olympics well the heat and the semi-final we ran pretty fast but in the final it's quite tactical because everyone waits for that kick at the end so yeah, it depends who's so in my heat and semi and we just just from knowing your competition, I knew I had two front runners, so I knew they were gonna be pretty fast and I knew they were gonna go straight to the front. So I just had to slot in. But in the final we All had right, no. Wait, front wait, runners. wait. I wanna to talk to you properly about the final in a little bit. I'm gonna get there. Just let's just give a little <laughs> little, little teaser there for our listeners. I wanna I wanna but before we get to the Olympics, right? Um you you obviously have to go start racing professionally, um, not only here in Australia, but head to Europe. I think you made the move to Melbourne um, under under coach Justin Rinaldi. Is that right? That's correct. Um, what's what was that move about, and and what's he been able to do for your you know your running, but probably your life as well? I'm assuming you're pretty tight with your coach as an athlete. Yeah, uh, yeah. The move with Justin was perfect. It's just because uh, you know when I was when I was in Perth, I was running 146 at the time, and the second fastest person was running 151. Yeah, it was just getting. It was getting boring and and just I wasn't I wasn't motivated and like to be honest I just thought I could I could probably go do something else so uh, I had to make the move and Justin was training Alex Rowe who was a strength record holder at the time and you know what a better idea to go train with the best at their home ground and and just get away from all distractions I was I was quite young and I liked, I had a bunch of friends and it was just, you, know, you kind of get distracted and it was just easy to get distracted because you're winning races. Like even if I wasn't running 146, that's, if I was running like 149s, I'd still be winning by two seconds, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. So I had to kind of go East and also it was super expensive to go East and compete all the time. So it just, yeah. it just made it, it just made it easy. And Justin, you know, hands down, um, the best 800 meter coach. So I just went down there for a training camp and I got along really well. And as you said before, you know, it's it's more a relationship with the coach rather than just the coaching itself. Like we hang out. I remember one time I went with Justin to Florence with his wife and we went for 10 days training camp and he came with myself and Joseph Deng to South Africa. So, you know, you, you just build that community and it becomes a team sport. 
Talk to me about Joseph Deng. He's a good mate of yours, housemate. Uh, but you're like big time rivals. I find that interesting. You guys are like top of the <laughs> top of the sport here in Australia, but you're living together, training against each other, and it's like two fighters under the same roof. But then you mates, right? Yeah, only because think about it. Like in the 800, there's 48 people that can run it in the world. Um, so three per country. So like me and Joseph, if we train together, there's still one spot there. It's not like we're fighting for one spot. Mm. There's three spots, and we believe that we should be able to get two. So, so we're not really competing against each other. We're we're just helping each other get better. And how we get better is to compete against each other and push each other. So it just works out. And then plus, like Joseph is just as chilled as I am, you know. So when when we're out in Europe and and we train, like some athletes just like to sit down and chill and and all that stuff. Like Joseph would be like, yeah, let's. How about we go? to the city how about we go check out some other places and and explore a little bit or something like that you know he's a little bit relaxed so it helps and then like we went to south africa together travel most of the world together right now so it's, it's pretty cool do you do you get it's to pretty do, cool to have that well yeah that's right do you get to do that um once you kind of start racing over in the circuit in europe do you get to is it just train 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 race or is there a bit of downtime and you get to enjoy yourself there's actually quite a bit of downtime just because the hardest training you do is right now in the off season. You know, when you start to compete, it's it's just trying to be refreshed because you're not trying to train too hard. You're trying to go into races fresh. So you have some time. So, you know, we we explore a lot of different cafes, different food, stuff like that. And then once the season's over, then we can like kind of go a little bit crazy and do whatever. Um, we won't mention what crazy is. Racing, in, racing 2 a.m. <laughs> Portugal yeah, females. That's, right. that's what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, is, hey, what does training look like for me, like as someone who's not a runner, like are you just or an run- athlete? Well, I'm a, yeah, athlete. I've played cricket, footy, <laughs> whatever. It doesn't matter. Like we all know I'm an athlete. He's got, he's got a trophy there. Yeah, he's got a trophy yeah, there. That's a, that's actually Where's a good point. your? I don't see a trophy of yours. No, I, don't, I don't actually have one. Um, what What does training look like? I assume it's not just running around a track, running 800 meters over and over and over again. Like, is there anything outside the ordinary that you're doing to help better your fitness or your? Um, like I don't know, hand-eye coordination, anything like that? Um, yeah, that's actually a really good question. It's valid. Uh, so I'll just tell you my week right now. Um, so this week, ending Sunday, I'll probably average 50Ks this week. So Monday was basically just a speed session, um, 2K warm-up, 2K cool down, and then five times 50 meters, two times 150. Tuesday, I had that was the toughest one. I had 16 by one-minute reps, and I was covering about 300 and... 33 meters, so about three minute K pace, um, but off 30 seconds um, in the heat. So you, that one was pretty tough. And then Wednesday, oh. um, we, Wednesday you go gym and you jog. So we, I had a recovery run, which is might not sound recovery to you guys, but it's 10 K at four minutes. I think, <laughs> yeah, our four, minute, our four minute K pace. Then Thursday was cruising, hills. I had about, cruising. I had about um, 12 times. 35 second up the hill and jog back back up and Fridays I have a day off get a massage and go to the gym Saturdays is distance so I've got six by 1k tomorrow and Sundays is a day off and that will take me to about 50 50k I got like yeah like I've got so many questions but like what's the support team like you are it is an individual sport even though you got this team around you got competitors and stuff what sort of support team gets you through that because those sort of Ks, that sort of training, that's more than I certainly ever did as a as an elite, you know, sports like footballer. And we had 50, 50 support staff looking after us. Who, who have you got looking after you to get you back on the track every day? Yeah, so I've got <clears throat> I've got my coach Justin Ronaldi. I've got my training partners. Um, we call the Fast Eight Track Club, and as you guys know, Joseph Dang is one of them. Um, I've got my manager who gets me into all different races. <clears throat> then I've got my strength conditioning coaches. So, um, Chris, so we do all the strength stuff and then we've also joined Pilates. So we've got a Pilates coach. Uh, and then obviously you've got your physios. So it's pretty big. Like it becomes like a massive team that no one really knows about because everyone sees you on the track by yourself. <clears throat> I'm just going to put this out there. Where, where are you doing your Pilates at the moment, Pete? My wife owns a Pilates studio. We'd be, we'd very happily have you whenever <laughs> you would like, mate. Free of charge. You come use the facility. I'll give you a key. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say no more. Um, I'm at KX. 
Oh, uh, yeah, don't worry about that. That's, they're, they're franchise themselves off, mate. We're a private, <laughs> independently owned studio. Oh, studio Equilibro, mate. you got to do it. Come down, paint hey, anytime. Where is it? Where it's in, it's where in is Lathlane. It? It's right near West Coast in uh, in Lathlane. Look, I'll, get, I'll sort the Uber out. I'll get a bus to your house. Don't worry, mate. We'll bring, on the, <laughs> bring the whole crew over. Don't worry about it. <laughs> if we're just um, advertising our wives' businesses, do yeah. you ever order flowers, Pete? Because my wife's a florist. <laughs> if you ever... <laughs> 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 Say no more. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have at the moment, so I can't advertise anything to you guys. Uh, but you, <laughs> it sounds like you're looking. Now, um, <laughs> all right. So. You're a smart man. You're a smart man. All right. Well, we'll see what we can do here at Backchat for you. Um, <laughs> all, right, all, right, all, right, all right. Let's bring this back. Money, <laughs> money and sponsorships. Um, Dan and I are both very keen to know, you know, like athletics and other Olympic sports, um, they got a reputation for not paying well. Um, does it pay the bills? Yeah, what sort of level do you have to get to to start signing some of these sponsorships? Um, yeah, that's actually a good question. Uh, and it's it's quite tough for a lot of athletes, and it was tough for me earlier. Um, but uh, Joe and I were pretty lucky. We got sponsored by Adidas. Um, Adidas International, so we've got a bad, I don't know how many years, but it's been a few years already. So we're quite lucky in that regards. And then you can pick up some brand other brand stuff but yeah it's really tough for Australian athletes just because one like no one knows when the races are going like I think one of the questions was like how, how did you prepare with for races without crowds I'm like like you just race in Australia <laughs> 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 like, like there isn't no crowd so like I, I mean where's the money gonna come from and all that so there's been a big issue about that for a while so it had it had to be more than like, you got to just be so passionate about the sport earlier on. Otherwise, you know, there's not much to keep you there. And that, because it's quite expensive, you got to go to Europe, compete against the best where the money is there. But to get the money, you got to be in those races and to get in those races, you got to be like top 10 in the world. So like, like in any hands down, any sport in the world, like the big sports, if you're 10 in the world, you're making a bunch of money. Yeah. But in athletics, you're just trying to get into the races to make the money. So it's, it's a bit different. Yeah, I've I've always heard this thing where Olympians don't make any money unless they unless they medal. Like I, I don't like how true is that? Is it a thing that you know you're obviously you get to compete on the world stage, but in terms financially, is it only beneficial if you do make that podium? Uh, uh, that's uh, honestly, I honestly don't even think you make money if you win. I think each country has their own. Like, I think maybe Australia's gold medal is like 50K or something like that. Mm. Um, but, but I don't think, I think Olympics is really just a pride thing. And usually if you're winning, you can't have your own sponsors and stuff like that. Like, like the tennis players don't go there to make money or the basketball players. They go to they just win the medals for their countries and, and for themselves. It's like just kind of legacy thing. But it's funny because it's like one of the biggest event in the world. But it's just amateur. It's just like the NCAA, right? Athletes don't really make any money there. Mm. Yeah, because they're still amateur, but the colleges are making a heap of coin. Uh, speaking of um, yeah, speaking of Olympics and medals, I've had this. I'd say it's somewhat controversial take um, on the high jump gold medal split. I'd love to get your take on that because for me, like a lot of people are saying, like, man, this is just this encapsulates the spirit of the Olympics to have two men like go. Oh, you know what? We're just going to share this medal. For me, I was like, you know what? The spirit of Olympics would be we fight it out until we get a gold. <laughs> what, what was your yeah. what was your take on the, the gold medal split at the high Whatever jump? Whatever Pete says here, I agree with. So whatever yeah, he okay, says. Yeah, okay, you know what? I'll... I'll, 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 no, I'll no, well, <laughs> it's, I think it's all perspective, right? I guess if I was in that position... I would honestly want to find it out and see who wins who wins gold. So in that regards, I'm on your side. Yeah. Um, but for them, I think they're just pretty good friends and and they wanted to share it. So it's which is completely legal. So they they could do that and and they did it. But I, and the crowd kind of liked it. I don't know. So yeah, well, I, well, I actually, didn't. what crowd? There wasn't any crowd. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, like so a lot of people kind of like that. But um, but I would want to find it out. I mean, I was happy for them both having gold medal. But I definitely want to fight it out to see who who kind of won. Is is there any such thing as a dead heat in a in eight hundred meters? Like they'll always find a winner, yeah. right? There's no such thing as a dead. There was heat, heats right? in the yeah, swimming but, though, right? There was, there was a few of them. There was like because it's touching a wall, whereas the eight hundred's like 
a bo- nose. All body. <laughs> they got the they got the line. Yeah, they, they always they always just watch those cameras and they give it to someone um, um, for eight, those races. Eight, and eight hundreds never get that close. Um, yeah, unless it's state final for me. Uh, it was actually <laughs> in my state final. Yeah. Are you Came. about to Are you about to talk eight hundred at the Olympics? I am. Yeah. Because Because I just want to ask one. Oh, no, no, I want to talk Olympics, not bef- not 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 Tokyo yet. Yeah. No, I just okay. want to ask a yeah. question about running. Yeah, great. So, in my small mind, I mean, we've we've discussed plenty of times. We're all athletes here, so we're we're all speaking amongst athletes. <laughs> <laughs> but but for me, um, the 800 meters is just running the 400 meters twice. Is there any element oh, of you where you could, where you think you could, like how much faster do you need to go to, to compete in the 400? Oh, no, that's completely different. That's a completely different story. <laughs> I told because, you, Because, <laughs> right, I think, I think at my best, if I train for 400, I think I could run like 45 low, which is not even the Olympic standard. So right. there's no point even trying to go to the 400. Uh, maybe I'd have more luck in the 1500, but but as you said, like you, you want to fight, you, you don't you don't want to go to Olympics just to be there as a passenger. Like so, you choose the event that you're more likely to make the final at. Like I mean, out like to be honest, like everyone was a lot of people were impressed with fourth and whatnot. But at the end of the day, I went home that well at the Olympic Village, I was disappointed. Like you came fourth. Like I mean, like I think the worst two positions is probably fourth and second. Because second, you're so close to gold, and fourth, you're so close to a medal. Yeah. Um, so there's still like major disappointments because you, you know, as an athlete, you're performance based. You're like performance based. Like it's it's great to be like a it's amazing experience, an amazing journey, and all that. But in reality, when you're sitting there by yourself, it's like, man, um, I still don't have a medal around my neck. Although that medal later on, it's like it's just a thing. Like that's intrinsic motivation. Um, it's just a thing later on and then the experience matters more later on like when you're speaking to people about it and stuff like that you speak about the journey but at that moment the medal matters you know yeah well, you, you do you feel like you're still lost right well i did <laughs> I, <came forward. laughs> I definitely lost how, yeah. how hard was it to sort of put on a, a happy face and just be you know like you say all the right things you know i'm just stoked to represent my country and and be here but you know, when your goal is to, to medal, like how, how tough was that for you, especially, you know, interviewing TV straight after a race? Well, I mean, I mean, my interview saying those things is, is like what you felt at the moment. And, and especially like you, you express gratitude to the people, to the people that stood there for you, which is your, which is for me was my support team and everyone. And then like through the rounds, it was like Australia was getting around it. So like, of course, like you got to show gratitude and everything. Cause like, you still got to be a good loser and you can't take anything away from the winners either. Like, you're not going to be mad. Like, Oh, like as if you lost by accident, like those guys were just bet on the day. Like you got to be realistic with yourself. Right. Yeah. Those guys just got the job done. Like the Kenyans came one too. And the Polish guy, they got the job done when it matters. And then because like I went to Europe a few weeks later and I think it was all the news that I beat the Polish guy. Like, it doesn't matter. Like you beat him two weeks, three weeks later, you need to beat him on the day. Cause that's what it counts for. Like, on the day on, on that time but um but like i wasn't i wasn't putting any face like at that moment i was i was still proud that i finished that race and i put myself like because i was at peace because i i race the way i wanted to race it's just they were just better that was it like and people i think people find that hard because you feel you sound like you're defeated but like like if that's what it is then that's what it is like they were just better on the day but it's still i was proud of of the way i raced because i put myself in a place to win and I want to twin, blah, 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 and all that stuff. But then, like, the other part of it is, like, man, like, there were so many people behind you and, and how much hype you created back home. So, like, man, we're, we're, we're grateful for that. We're so thankful for that. And we're thankful for – athletics doesn't get that much attention. So, we, to bring that much attention to athletics is is awesome. And then, like, to see your family out there celebrating and stuff like that, like you won a medal, it's it's pretty cool. What um, what did the effect of uh, Rio – so, Rio Olympics 2016 <laughs> – um, you experience what the Olympics is all about, right? Well, you know, traditionally all about you got the Olympic Village with people in it. You got crowds cheering you on. Um, you know, you qualified for that and, and went over there and raced, and probably didn't go well. I mean, listening to speak to you speak about coming fourth in the Olympics, you, I assume you wouldn't have been happy getting knocked out in the heat to the Olympics in 2016. How, how did that experience kind of leave you? Oh, that man, I was sad. Yeah, I think I gained I gained like four 
five kgs at the olympics you know <laughs> especially because it was my first games and and you just kind of try to maximize on everything like capitalize on all the experiences and I, I i told this story a few times like generally you're not you're not too excited about food like it is what it is but when it's free damn man you just <laughs> <laughs> you just you just kind of go hard like when 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 like th- because like put yourself in my position like five years and i made the olympic team so i didn't make any australian team no juniors nothing that was the first time to wear australian single and i was straight away into the olympics and i've never been to any other championships so like um getting excited about like things like free food and like haircuts getting three haircuts although my hair was short all those <laughs> all those stuff and and getting excited to meet like um you know i see you were in golden state there like um clay thompson um meeting him usain bolt and all that stuff you just you just, just kind of go crazy as a 22 year old you just kind of like whoa like damn and then like i think there was experience where patty mills comes up to me and and like he's so nice and introduces himself and says welcome to the team and that and i'm like why is this guy introducing himself like i know who he is like <laughs> like like what is he doing um <laughs> so so like of course of course at that moment like you you're still disappointed but you're like you're just you probably underperform not because of fitness just because there's there's that energy you got to maintain pretty like optimal and then like when you're getting excited about food your energy is going too high and you kind of got to just be like in the middle and like getting excited about all these things and and whatnot um i was pretty disappointed getting out of the heat especially like running what was it like a 149 or something like that um it was ridiculous like i was i was just not happy and i just partied it out and did the normal things and came home like five kgs heavier but you know you look back and you're like man this is my first olympics not too bad so you don't look back on it with like a oh, lost opportunity you kind of used it as a all right this is probably what i I need to tighten up next time around because I mean it clearly worked. Yeah, you know, five years later at Tokyo. <laughs> nah, definitely, definitely not. Um, a lost opportunity because because the opportunity was being there. Um, and to be like realistically, uh, I, I didn't make it out the heat, so it's not like I missed out a medal. Like I wasn't even close to a medal. I was out just in the heat. There was no semifinals. Maybe if I was in the finals, like damn. Like I was close to metal. Like now it's like damn because I was close to metal. But back then I was just I was just there. I was literally a passenger, and I was excited to be a passenger. Do you subscribe to the? Uh, I mean, Will I know doesn't, but the you got to lose one to win one sort of <laughs> notion. Like, do you use that then? Like, okay, two thousand and twenty-one, sort of lost one. The next one is is your chance. Um. Yeah, as I said, like I think I think it's all language, right? Um, because, like, you can plan as much as you want, uh, and like, there's also good intentions in planning and setting goals. But I mean, you still got to put it together on the day. And and the reality is, I set myself goals before, and I didn't rock up to the start line. Like, our sport is pretty tough. Like, when it cuts only to three people, um, and I think that's what I pride myself for: being consistently being able to make teams. Cause it's pretty hard to make teams. You got to be consistently top three and like, think about it. You can't be sick on the day of Olympic trials. You, you can't have a bad day. So like consistently making teams is people should be rewarded for, cause it's hard. It's only three people that make it. And then if you can consistently make it every year and those that consistently medal at the major championships, then like they're the goats, like they're figured it out, like mentally, physically, they just, they just do something well, you know, you, you don't know how to define it. You don't know what it is, but they just figured it out. And, and you can see they just, the way they move and everything they do is just like, it's just beautiful. Did you, did you ever race against David Radisha? I did actually in Perth. The first time I raced oh. against him was in Perth and I came second to him and I, I was like running around 146 and this guy was jogging like 144. <laughs> <laughs> this, this guy's like, I don't know, man, like, uh, anyone who's listening or watching, just go and Google 2012 <laughs> London Olympics uh, 800 meter final. It's so every man in that race ran a PB, uh, season best, uh, like country's best. There was like five national records broken in it. He broke the world record, first man to go under 141, and it's commonly called the greatest race of all time. And this guy is like absolutely killing it he's like the proper goat so um running in his stride what? like what did it feel like 
what, what, just quickly, what time did you run on the 400? Because you run 153, so uh, what time did you Like, yeah, ne- never went under 50. So, yeah. So, so that's the crazy thing, right? David Radisha ran 49 first lap and then he closed in 51. It's crazy. So, without stopping. So he was like a 2400 thing. Um, yeah. Like crazy. running running in his stride back then, it was probably like, he's just too fast. Like I think I needed to be running in his stride around now where I'm a lot fitter, at least I'm a 144. So he could push me a little bit further. But before that, man, I was, I was always too far behind, like five, 10 meters behind because he's just too far ahead. But it's just being in the same race as him is awesome. Yeah, amazing. Um, but but the worst thing is you, as an athlete, you know they say like mentally you got to go into every race thinking you're gonna win. But like what what if you know you're not gonna win? Like because <laughs> like you're racing David Radisha, like there's all right, I'm gonna try to come second today. Like that's a bad thought to have, but that's reality. <laughs> it's, it, but he would never have. Yeah, it's an interesting concept because like people say this all the time in footy, like <laughs> oh, like why are you guys even going out there? You're not gonna you're not gonna win. But there's there's still opportunity. David Radisha, you're not yeah. you're not beating him. Don't even worry about it. Just fucking back it up. <laughs> uh, all right, all right, all right. Tokyo Olympics. Um, you know, I think like for anyone out there outside of athletic circles, it's probably you know your your big step up to I guess the limelight. Um, we've spoken a bit about what the experience of Rio gave you, which you know by the sounds of it wasn't a lost opportunity. It was something you just kind of you know used along the journey. Um, how was Tokyo different? Like I'm assuming the setup was different, COVID wise and uh, Olympic Village wise. Did it feel like the Olympics, given what you experienced in Rio? Um, yeah and no. I mean, the good thing about Tokyo because there was so there was so much res- restrictions. Like I felt like connection kind of went up because with not much to do everyone kind of relied on each other so like the australian team was way stronger than they were in tokyo because like we'd all get around each other's events we'd all sit down have coffee because that's all you could really do there's like i think if it was if it was like a normal olympics then you'd have people leaving the village doing this exploring and stuff like that uh, but the australian team was so close during the olympics and like we got along um pretty well uh like watching everyone's races watching the boxing, Harry Gar side, watching the basketball and the girls on the beach volleyball. So like it was awesome atmosphere in that regard. But um, I guess it was different in a way that uh, the stadiums were quite empty. Uh, there was no one there. And then, <clears throat> but still you just, you just had to go out there and perform. <clears throat> like you just had a job to do. Like you, you couldn't worry about it. And you had an extra year to kind of figure that out. I and mean, we already knew there was no, there was no crowds and stuff like that. What was it true? The the uh the beds were made out of cardboard. Was that was that true? There were, but I think there were so many rumors why they were made out of cardboards. But I don't think that's true because these <laughs> beds, these out, beds or? were. <laughs> no, no. If you think about it, right, these beds were these beds were designed and made before COVID hit. So like, so like they were designed way before that. So, um. Were they comfortable? Yeah. Um, man, I performed all right, so <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think they were pretty comfortable. All right, so you run your heat, run it really well, goes well. Coming into the semi, um, first semi in the in the Olympic Games, how are you feeling? Because um, uh, spoiler alert, <laughs> uh, Pete goes on and wins the semi final and runs the Australian record. <laughs> so you must have been feeling okay. How did it feel that day, the semi final? I honestly wake woke up that day because like the first thought I think with many people is like shit he's ran too fast he's, he's because you get you get to wake up and run run again like but not just run fast I've ran my fastest time ever and and broke a Australian record in the heat so you got to go back the next day yeah. and run again uh so I think maybe there's a little bit of concern I, I was a little bit maybe worried and then I woke up that next morning and I just woke up and I was like damn I think I could run 144 again today. I just felt like I never ran the next the, um, the day before. And then I went there and I warmed up. I was like, no, I could really run 144. So when when I stood at the start line, I was just kind of smiling. I was like, man, I'm, I can't wait for this gun to go. Because <laughs> my body feels like unreal. Like, you know, you, you know, through the warm up, you're just bouncing. You feel sharp. You feel fast. And and just everything's going right. So you just, you just kind of knew it. Is it body or mind then? Like I'm assuming you, you know, you've been as fit as you were, and 
done what you've done for a lot lot now. <coughs> you talk about muscle memory. Um, your body knows what to do. Is it is it mind or body? Um, it's mind. And then the mind is impacted by small things. Like if you have a niggle, then the mind goes kind of crazy. If you're sore, the mind kind of it's like, oh man, I don't know if I could do a fast pace and all that stuff. But like, and then that that's why the body's important too. If the body's super healthy and you feel fresh, then the mind is, it, it helps the mind as well. So yeah. So I, I just felt like I didn't run and I felt like I was pretty fresh. So it helped me take all that focus from my body, like nothing's going to go wrong and just kind of be present and focus on the race and hands down like the best races you ever race is those races you're not thinking about anything it's just muscle memory you just go out there and race because in our sports if you're thinking about making a move someone's probably already made it like i've raced some races where i'm thinking like all right now i've got to go and i tried to go someone's already made it it's like you just got to kind of make it after you ran that semi i know in in sports like basketball <laughs> There's a lot of tape watching. You know, you watch the game, or you watch you're gonna, uh, you're about to to verse next week. Do you then go back and watch that race, or is it sort of like, okay, that race is done, like I can't learn from that, or or do you go back and then sort of build on that? Um, I actually watched, I watched the heat, and then I watched the semi. So I watched all my races and. Um, and I love listening to Bruce, man. He, <laughs> so you watch it with the commentary? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got it, bro. So good. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I was sitting there. I was literally sitting there on my cardboard bed. I'm like, <laughs> damn, this race is this race is so much exciting watching it than being in the stadium because they have the noise control and Bruce is talking because you can't hear any of that while you're running. Yeah. You're just literally running two laps. And then when you're watching, you're like, man. That's exciting. <laughs> so, so that race, that race, like I, I watched it again, um, just prepping, just because you know I just sit around and watch eight hundred meter runs <laughs> all the time. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I watched that race, and like that was the perfect race. Um, tactically, you're able to sit on someone, kind of you know opened up with one fifty to go, and and you kind of hit the lead and held it to the end. It was it was as you would want to run an eight hundred meter race, right? You almost had a bit of a pacemaker, good pace for the race, but that was pretty different for your final, right? Um, before we get to the final, so you felt good coming in the heat, felt good coming in the semi, couple of Australian records. Are you waking up day of the final? Okay, here we go. Here's, here's three from three. Um, waking up for the final was a bit different because it was like, it was like a moment, like after the semis, it was like, oh shit. <laughs> and I say that, I say that because we, we knocked out the two front runners and like the final had not a single front runner. It's like, oh shit, this race is gonna be slow. Yeah. Like no one's gonna lead this race. It's just gonna be slow. And if you leave it too slow, you can't be in the middle because that's where you trip up. Yeah. You can't be at the back because you're racing against the best people in the world. You can't give them head starts. And you don't wanna be at the front because you're taking all the win. So that now you're just thinking about too many things like that you weren't thinking about it before. Like if you're sitting behind someone, it's just like, it's automatic. If the race is fast, it's automatic, it's gonna be fast. But when, when you knock out all the front runners and then and then you see through the bell is like 50, whatever that lap was, because the first... 53, few, 53 and a half. It's good. 53, mm. 53 is like, man, like that's a slow race. So like. you hit the lead, you hit the lead with, so this is in the final, Dan. Um, Pete hits oh, the lead. I've watched it Pete hits, many Pete, times. He hits the lead with like 50 to go in the, in the first lap, about 600, 550 to go. Um, was that in the plan? Um, um, yeah, I think it was, it was, I just didn't want to get boxed in and get in trouble. I think the only thing I would do differently is take the lead and just trust in yourself. Like it was saying that is you don't need to go out from that fire out. I think I went out from like 400 or something. You can hold it back because you, you're holding everyone back. Like you're at the front, just, just hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. And just keep picking it up as people get closer to you. Did you? Did you? Did you? Um. Did you think you could match the kick with the rest of the runners? Like, did did you have uh, as much speed as the rest of the race? If you had have held it back. Yeah. Um. I was. I was pretty confident in Tokyo, so I just thought, like, man, whatever happens, happens, and and whatever comes my way, I'll be able to handle it. But like. It, what, we were speaking about 400s before and I said, no, nah, I wouldn't do 400 because at my best, I'd probably be able to run 46, 45, right? Um, the guy that won the race, he runs 44 seconds. Like there's no one beating him in a kickdown <laughs> in, in a slow race because he's got all his energy there. 
So especially when he's at the front and he was like right on my shoulder, he was in the, in the best position and he was the f- fastest 400 re- meter runner. So like he's going to win that race. Like there's no brainer there because he's got the fastest kick um, and he's got the fastest 400 times. So there's a few things to work on there, but like it's just headache, you know. You don't want to be thinking about that during the race. What did you think when you're coming down? There's 50 <laughs> meters to go. You're lead, you're you're leading the race with 100 to go, um, and three guys come past you, and you you had a look around. You, you actually looked. Don't know if you've watched the race back, but you have a look, kind of behind you and, and next to you, which you hadn't really done in the other races. But what do you think, yeah. what are you thinking there with 50 to go? Like, what's in your mind? Uh, other than I was like, fuck, oh. this hurts so much. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit, another four years or three years to try again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, like I've, I kind of like, I actually, like, never spoken to you before, but like your attitude just, it seems like you're able to brush things off pretty quickly. Like, because like we, we spoke about it before, it's like, it's like I wouldn't be having these opportunities if it wasn't for sports, right? That's why I've got, um, the podcast in my spikes because like at the end of the day, like, although I want to win, like, let's think about the other part of it. Like just being able to have that opportunity to be at the Olympics and travel the world and do all these things. It's like, that's why you got to kind of, it's like, it's not like I don't care. It's just that it just keeps you more at peace. It's like, man, we're here because, because of this. So like, at least <laughs> let's be happy that we're here. Yeah. I know we lost, but, <laughs> but like, what can you do? Like, yeah. like, honestly, what can you do? Like you can't change it. So what's next for Pete Bowl? Um, getting some flowers and a <laughs> <laughs> I've, about um about the race. One quick one for you. What does it sound like when you? I mean, obviously it's different when you're running with a crowd, but when you're not, like a, a guy's saying any. Like I imagine it's all pretty <laughs> business. As you know, people aren't really chatting. It's not like Tour de France where like guys are having conversations <laughs> mid race. But are you just like you're hearing people panting? Is it like is does any of that sort of throw you off, or are you just so in your race that you're not even paying attention to any of that? Nah, you're you're just so in your race, and if you're not, you're probably <laughs> losing the race. <laughs> um, and and if if you can talk, then that's extra energy. And even like pushing and stuff like that, like um, it takes so much energy to push people around. Um, <clears throat> so you probably prefer not to get in trouble and. The worst part of the 800 is the first 200 when everyone cuts in yeah. like because because if you try to cut in when someone is there someone will push you out the way you might trip over it takes energy it takes time and athletics is all about time you don't want to lose any time unless you don't know that you're allowed to cut in like you did back when you were <laughs> stay running in the in the stay in your lane man. Uh, i what? still won that race <laughs> <laughs> Of course you did, mate. You're the fucking Australian <laughs> champion. Dad, what about what about pregame? Like, what about um, they'd have you in a in a holding bay of some description before they bring you out onto the uh, the Aths track. Like uh, at Tokyo, they had the big like unveil where it was like a movie stars entering yeah. the arena. Is there any trash talk back there? Is there any talk, or is everyone just in their own own world? Nah, there's no there's <laughs> like I don't think running is. Running's not the one people just trash talk because it's over in like two minutes. <laughs> uh, but I think may- maybe more with the you see it maybe more with the with the sprinters. Um, it's funny because that's actually shorter. Uh, yeah. It's like what nine seconds for the guys, and now the girls running like ten five, yeah. which is insane. Um, but with the distance guys, like we generally all pretty good friends. You got to be friends because you're running that many mile, miles and kilometers per week. You got to use people and train with them. So, you know, when you're overseas, you train with your competitors and join together. So we tend to be friends. While the sprinters tend don't really tend to be that friendly with each other sometimes. Um, but not 800 guys are pretty cool. No trash talk. And if someone trash talks me, I'll honestly just laugh. I think it would make <laughs> it would just... It'll, it'll just be funny. Like it's it's not a fight. Like it's, a, it's, a, it's like it's like you're you're 61 kgs. You're about to go around 800 meters. Like, <laughs> what did you think of the fanfare around the 100 meter sprint? Like that, you know how they had all the lights and the lanes all lit up. Are you seeing that going? Like, come on, give us some of that as well. Or is are you just putting it down to like 100 meter egos and stuff? That I guess because the 100 meters is like you crowned it like the fastest man in the world and like with the history and Usain Bolt and and like I mean look look at our 100 meter guys sprinter like Ron Browning like 
like that was exciting just to watch and and you know i wish imagine it like if he made the final it would have like those everyone would have been watching that final it would be unreal just for him to win that semi not a heat and just look around it was it's like damn like that's awesome like that's that's the swag of the hundred meters. Like I, I can't envy that. Like like let them eat, let them be, let them do themselves. So it's that t- it's that type of energy. You it's know? like the forward line, Dan. It's the, the forwards. <laughs> yeah. They just got to kick the, the goals. They got to go get their hair cut nicely. They got to get you know a bit, yeah. a bit of meat. They got to do, do do whatever they can, man. That's, yeah. Um. What it's about of it? Well, what about Paris? Paris is three years away. When does the prep start for them? Like. I know, I know the answer's like, oh, prep starts now, you know, come off the track. But when you actually start prepping for that, like those races, is it six months out? Is it 18 months <laughs> out? When's that all begin? Um, well, because Paris is like, I guess, long, long-term long goal because it's three years away. But like next year, we've got Commonwealth Games. So you just kind of focus on that. And preparation tends to be the same anyways. So you focus on, because World Champs is just as important as as the Olympics. What, it's the same to, people to you? What's the most important to you? Um, probably the Olympic Games. <laughs> 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 so, so Paris is pretty important. Yeah. But uh, like, while you're preparing for Paris, Paris, the bills. Yeah, you, you got to do the World Champs, and it'd be nice winning World Champs. Like, it it'd be just as tough. The only difference with World Champs and Olympics is that World Champs is just athletics. So, literally, it's just in the village with different type of athletes, but you're still competing against the same people at the world champs and at the olympics so they're just as important in my opinion and so we got that next year we got commonwealth next next year the following year we got world champs again and then the following year we got paris so it's like big three years and if you can come home with medals like that would be pretty sick yeah bloody oath it was you're, li- you're living in melbourne is perth home is that is this where you'll end up <coughs> yeah eventually i think i'll move back to perth uh but I quite, I quite like Melbourne. It's it's cool lifestyle. It's it's nice. It's not too hot. Like tomorrow is thirty six degrees, and I'm I'm like negotiating with my coach. Like, should I be training? It's like <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty hot. Um, while Melbourne is pretty cool, you can do a lot more distance running. It's easier over here. Although the the benefit is training in the heat, you do get fit pretty fast. You just gotta not cook yourself, and you know. Where, where where are you training while you're here at Perth? Uh, what time and day? So I'm going to come race. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I actually train with my I actually train with Abra. So if anyone wants to go train with him, <laughs> oh. we train we train um hills up in is it Claremont Robert Hill is that Mac Cla- Perry Lakes? Yep. Um, yep. Sometimes I train at Langford Noble. Sometimes I train at Thornley. I'm all over the place, just mixing it up, not to get bored. You got anything else for Pete? I'm, I'm, no, I've just been loving it. Um, when's when's the next big one? Is it Birmingham? Is that where Commonwealth Games is? Yeah, Birmingham. Uh, but two weeks before that is World Champs, so that's that's first. How's that work? So two yes. weeks apart, you got Birmingham and World Champs two weeks apart. Is that right? Yeah. So so so, so what? You just do like a big block of work and then and and try to try to run well for a three week period kind of thing. My understanding is you, you focus, although Commonwealth games is, it's a lot more hype around in Australia, but world champs is the important one. Commonwealth games is not because, you know, not every country is part of the Commonwealth. So you're missing a lot of different, different countries. Well, when, when, when you're traveling around, do you get to watch any footy? Do you get, do you get to watch West coast go at it? Uh, yeah, sometimes, sometimes I watch, uh, but mostly when I'm in Melbourne, I get to watch a few of the games. Mm. Um, I actually haven't watched a game in Perth oh, a while ago, maybe, but not recently. I think we should do back chat with Pete Bowl live mm. at a game. If you're ever yeah. in town and we're in town, we'll ta- <laughs> we're taking you a game. Oh, we're definitely going to be in town. Yeah, we are. We'll be, let's we'll, do we'll be it. I won't let's, be running anywhere. <laughs> let's, let's do it. Yeah, I'm real, mate. And I, and I want to see Will's 800 metres... In action, I still maintain. Yeah, I've got. I've got a tape of it. We can watch it after this. No, I, I want to see it in real life. You versus I was, Pete. I'm not going to p- beat Pete now. I, no, I might have beaten him when I was 17 years old. He said it. He's the one who said it. 206. I was one. But, but as three. I said, I said yesterday doesn't matter. A few minutes yeah, doesn't matter. Like right now, that matters. 
All right. right now. All right. I'll race you in an 800 meter race. <laughs> right. Okay. Let's do that. And then we'll do handicap. We'll no, do handicap. Right? No, no. And then and then we can play a game of footy. You play, I play, and and we'll see who can get the. You know, we'll have Best a few. Average. Yeah, a few, few, few bumps, few tackles. See how you hold up against that big boy. <laughs> <laughs> Roll I'll, I'll just, I'll just scissor kick you and grab the ball. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt it. You're dunking in uh, school. Uh, Pete, we're gonna wrap this up, mate. But like, seriously, absolute pleasure. Uh, the best guest we'll ever have on. I'm so, so good to interview you, mate. And um, such a great attitude. Thanks so much for your time, mate. No, thanks a lot, boys. Thanks for having me, and look forward to meeting you guys in person. When you wrap, when you um. When you get this going, in your spikes is your podcast, right? When you got a bit more time, let's do this again. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll tell you about uh, my running ability, so you can interview me about running. That'll yep. be good. I'm here for cricket, yep. basketball, whatever. I can do anything. Just um, <laughs> yeah, I stories. And um, I- I'm gonna send you my address, and I need some flowers. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. Thanks, Pete. You're a legend. Thank you so Thank much. You. All right, your hair's back. Shirts are back. Yeah, Peter Bowl, I, I, I look. We've we've done already like in a short time of interviewing people. We've had some great interviews, but I enjoyed that the most. Maybe mm-hmm. I'm maybe I fanboy too hard. I'm sorry if I did. It's okay. Do I have to apologize to you or the listeners? I'm no, sorry, no listeners, one. if you I was fanboy. Apologize to anyone. I really enjoyed it. He's got a sick story and like making it in athletics and eight hundreds even. Like it's not something that Australians really do. No. So the fact is, I mean, I could if I could if I wanted to, but I pursued other things. And you know what I said? If Peter Bowl ticked off my achievements, it meant it was a thing. And he was happy with it. Yeah, he's being nice. That's okay. Um, now, we don't have any Scotials this week. No, we don't. Um, and look, that's a big loss. Scotial media, big part of this podca- podcast. So the only way that I thought we could kind of cover for it. Yes. There is probably only one way. What's it called? What's this called? You call it. We speak it. No, but we're calling it. Yes, I know, but we've made that mistake from the very okay. beginning. Okay, what's it called? You call it, we speak it. You want to send your mobile number to us mm-hmm. and you want to trust us with your private information. Mm-hmm. Of course, we won't give it out, but we will use it to develop content for this podcast. So we're about to ring a loyal listener. So this is Keely Judge. Yeah. She just said, hey guys, loving the pod. I'm a late comer to back chat, but I've pretty much caught up on every episode in about five days. So up to date as of yesterday, and officially a Patreon. Thank you. Oh, I think, like, Keely might be ticking every box. We've been speaking about this a little bit, like, how do you grow listeners? How do you grow audience? How do you grow subscribers on YouTube? What, whatever you're doing, Keely's ticked every box. Mm-hmm. Going back and listen to the episodes. A lot of our stuff we've done in the past is pretty timeless, right? Like, yeah. you can actually go back and listen to it. Yeah, yeah, So, yeah. Keely's ticking boxes. She wants to s- goals. send it, say it, call it. What's it called? You call it, we speak it. Let's do it. I'm um you know through the joys of technology just going to hit call right now. Let's okay. put some headphones on. I right. don't really know what we're going to talk about. Neither do I. I'm excited though. Hope she answers. Be, be good, Hello. Be a good podcast if she doesn't answer. Hi, Keely. Will Schofield, Dan Const here. How are you? Keely. Hello. I'm good. How are you guys? Yeah, good. Look, uh, I'm hoping you were expecting this call because we've been putting the call out uh, on the podcast for a little while now. Send your number in. We'll give you a call. Have a chat. You've done it. Did you expect us to even call you? No, not at all, to be honest. So it's lovely to chat to you. All right, Keely, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand the microphone quickly to you. This could go poorly. I'm going to give you the mic and say, what do you want to speak about? You've got, you've got the microphone. You've got the audience, the huge audience that is Back Chat Podcast. Mm. Dan and I are listening and so are they. What do you want to speak about? Let's speak about something. All right, well... Yeah, you caught me off guard. So. <laughs> um, look, I um, big fan, big fan. I just realised before, actually, I've realised I was a bit late to the podcast, but I've caught up on about twenty eight episodes in less than a week. So that's like Very thirty good. to thirty five hours of you guys that I listened to instead of doing a uni assignment that I handed in two minutes before it was due last night. So how, time well spent. How, I was going to say, how's that time been in your life? It sounds very exciting. <laughs> Oh, yeah, time well spent, I reckon. <laughs> Upon reflection, <laughs> seeing as you've consumed it all in such a short space of time, um, any initial thoughts? Yeah, you'd actually know, wouldn't oh, you? Oh, love it. It's um, it's good to hear you guys be able to chat to a lot of the players that I've watched for pretty much my whole life. Like, even just listening to you, Will, I um, 
I was lucky enough to watch you at your very last home and away game over here in Brisbane because I'm I'm from Brisbane. So are you in Brisbane right now? I got to see you. I am. So it's nine thirty at night. Mm, wow. Well, thanks for picking up. This is good. I didn't realise we were going across the uh, the Nullarbor here, Dan, to Brisbane. Very yeah. good. Keely, I right believe. The country. I believe if our research is correct, you got a birthday <laughs> coming up. <laughs> When you yeah, say research, I do. it's, it's you next, next legit week. just telling us in, in an email. <laughs> How old are you turning, Keely? Um, 26. 26. Uh, so uh, it's not, not very exciting, but one step closer to 30. A, Sam Butler's number. A very happy birthday, Sam Butler's number. <laughs> just trust Thank me, you. when you Must get to 30, lucky. you don't want to be aiming for 30. It's all downhill from 30. No. No. I, I rebuke that. Kid. Why? 30 is awesome. Why? You're in your prime. <laughs> You're 30. I actually, um, I did do some prep in case you guys called. So okay, okay. I was hoping. I, I was hoping that um, yeah, maybe you had this when I gave you the mic. But this is good. I like this, Keely. Do it. Well, it's coming. So, well, I went and got your stats from the last home and away game that you played when I got to see you here in Brisbane. So, okay, okay good. This is, this is what you did. Um, so West Coast defeated the Lions 72 to 98 and my boyfriend's a massive Brisbane Lions supporter. So that was extra sweet. Good. Um, well, you had five disposals, four kicks, one handball, two marks, four tackles, zero goals and zero behind. Huge. With 79% time on ground. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm honestly trying to look for the positives here. I'm hoping you're setting me up for like, but this is what you did for the but team. The yes. week after, you were actually dropped, but then you came back <laughs> under a medical thing yeah. and ended Forced up playing a cracker of a game and then took us to the grand final and ended up, ended up, ended up being a premiership player. So, oh, so this you is can't my, complain. This oh. is my last game in 2018. Mm. Yep. I thought you were yep. talking Over my last game. Oh, I remember this. I got dropped after that game. You're dead set right. You did. You did. And then someone got injured, I think, in training and you got brought back in. No, but Bra it was good. Brad, Brad, like Shepherd, going Brad, Brad Shepherd got injured in the uh, qualifying was. final. But It was Shep. Yeah, it was Shep. But I was extremely, I remember, extremely upset and annoyed at getting dropped after that game in 2018. But the stats you've just reeled off to me, <laughs> five touches, four kicks, one handball and two marks, probably deserved what, it. What, the stats in, don't in always hour, tell the truth. An hour and a half. That's yeah. it, but the stats don't always tell the truth. You've got no, to that. that is right, Keely. Well, I appreciate you doing some research for us. This, uh, well, I hope it's not the last time we speak, but if it is... It won't be. What do you want to leave the Back Chat podcast with? What's your legacy? Oh gosh! Um, Such a hard question. <laughs> What's your <laughs> legacy? Bloody hell! Legacy, legacy is a, a big. Um, she's twenty six. I don't know. It's just good to be able to speak to you guys. Thanks for calling. Um, big fan, big fan for a long time. So, um, well, I've been watching you since like I was a kid, and Dan, big fan of you as of recent. So, yeah. tell me about um, Dan. No, before oh, this is your legacy. Yeah, this yeah. is your legacy, <laughs> Keely. You've watched me since I was a child. What about? Dan, what she do, hasn't watched me since she was, since I was a child. What do you think about Dan? No, but I mean, he's funny and he keeps you in line, so it's good. Yeah, good, keeps you in line. tick and yeah. tick. Well done, Keely. Thanks for joining us on the show. We appreciate it. Thanks and, so much, um, guys. We, yeah, Dan's putting your number away right you now. You should um, yeah, I'm it get right. an episode with with sure. Oscar Allen and Hamish Brayshaw together. I reckon that'd be a good one. <laughs> oh, I like it. I reckon it. we could fit in one more seat to bring the in. at the table as Four well. Four seats at the table. Are you a YouTube subscriber, Keely? Yes, I am. Oh, there was a pause good. there. Yeah. You go and do Just that do right now. Thank and you, Patreon. Keely. <laughs> and Patreon. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks, Keely. All the best. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks. There you go. There you have it. Can I take the headphones off now? Yeah, I'm going to take mine off too. Keely, what a treat. Yeah, that was great. It's good hearing from fans. What, look, that's all we want. Send us your number. Yeah. We'll call it. You speak it. I look, I know I gave her a couple of platforms to speak. And sometimes if you're not expecting a call or if you're not used to speaking in front of a microphone, mm. like you were a bit like that, a bit of a stunned mullet, were you, when, when you first got in front of the mic and the, in the camera? No. Nah. Nah. I reckon you might have. I certainly was. You're a big dog now, yeah. You get recognised. <laughs> <laughs> you get recognised. Uh, that's yeah. it. Peter Bowl today. It was great. Um, you can catch us wherever you catch us. Backchatpodcast.com.au. YouTube, subscribe, click the thingy, do the thing. Yeah. Just get around us. All the things. Get all around us. 